It's good to see everyone here this evening. Revelation chapters 4 and 5 are our text for this evening as we look now as the visions begin. We actually saw kind of a prelude of a vision in chapter 1 where John saw uh, a picture of the Lord, a vision of the Lord described in all the terminology that is used of God in the Old Testament. Uh, We're going to come back to that now in chapters 4 and 5 and even though we sometimes view the, uh, the letters in chapters 2 and 3 as kind of a break in the visions, actually they are intimately related. Remember in chapter 1, Jesus, as we just said, was presented to us in all of his divine glory using descriptions of the Old Testament that are normally used of God. And that is intentional to describe Jesus in his deity. We noted then in chapters 2 and 3... Jesus caring for and rebuking his people, making them promises of protection, but also warning them about the consequences if they don't correct the things that were deficient among them. He talked to them about the victory that he would enjoy, how they would share in that, how he would give them uh, things that only he could give them uh, if they would remain faithful. And the last thing we heard was chapter 3 and verse 23 that to him who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And so as we hear that message about the throne of God ringing in our ears, it is in that light now that we turn in chapters 4 and 5 to see the throne of God. And of course, Jesus is going to figure very prominently in this picture. The Old Testament context uh, behind chapters 4 and 5, well, there's a lot of it. We're going to see several scenes before we're done, but perhaps the one that is the most prominent is Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and following. And we don't have the time this evening to read that passage or even to, uh, you know, consider it carefully, but there is a vision that Daniel has there of God. He is called the Ancient of Days. And as Daniel is viewing this vision and sees God in his glory, he says that in the vision that there was one who came to him, that is, came up to the Ancient of Days, and he was given dominion and a kingdom that would last forever and ever. We understand, of course, as we look at Daniel chapter 7, that uh, Daniel was looking at the Messianic age and that that vision was a picture of the establishment of the Messianic age. But it is defined and uh, depicted in these heavenly cosmic terms. It's not a picture of the Lord starting his church or people coming to worship the risen Lord, or anything like that. It's a scene that takes place in heaven, where the glory of God is on full display, and it is in that picture of majesty and awe in the presence of God himself that this figure, this Son of Man, receives this great unshakable kingdom. And that same basic idea that there is God in his glory And then that power and that glory is invested in Jesus is the same picture that we see here in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. It basically repeats that scene in the same basic order with some small variations uh, that are custom designed for the uh, picture that John is painting here. There are also some similarities with Ezekiel, chapters 1 and 2. The book of Revelation is heavily indebted to the book of Ezekiel, as we will see many, many times before we're done with our study. But uh, that is also in the background here as well. Um, Just as kind of a, a point about the Old Testament allusions, I forget how many verses there are in the book of Revelation. There's something like... I think the number 450 comes to mind for some reason. Something like 450 verses. But there are more than 450 allusions to the Old Testament in the book. Uh, Just about every word we read in the book of Revelation has something that is brought out of the Old Testament. And 
This scene here in chapters 4 and 5 certainly is no exception to that. It is a picture that is heavily steeped in the Old Testament. Uh, Interestingly enough, though, this is not the first time that this depiction of God or this vision of God has been shown to us in the Bible. Somebody please go to Exodus 24 and uh, read for us verses 9, 10, and 11. Somebody else can go to 1 Kings 22 and verse 19, and we'll consider those passages. Who's got the uh, Exodus 24 passage? Can read those three verses. Caleb? Strange scene. Leaves us wanting to ask a lot of questions. What exactly did they see? Because the Bible is adamant that no one has seen God, but they saw something that was a representation of God, at least from God himself. And you'll notice that it is said that he that there was a pavement underneath him as of sapphire, brilliant, beautiful, glorious, and uh, breathtaking. 1 Kings 22.19, we have here a prophet describing what he has seen. Who has that passage? Yes, David. Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne all the host of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. And so here we have the prophet Micaiah seeing God in heaven and has a glimpse into the council of God where the decision is made about Ahab, and he says that I saw God surrounded by these beings. Uh, Isaiah chapter 6, of course, we can't forget that vision in the Old Testament where in the year of King Isaiah's death, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew, and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And then there is uh, Psalm 97. The Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let the many islands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness surround him, righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. His lightnings lit up the world, the earth saw and trembled. The mountains melted like wax at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the Lord of the whole earth. The heavens declare his righteousness and all the peoples have seen his glory." We have there a kind of another one of these throne scenes depicted in the psalm as well. These throne scenes very often uh, have at least one thing in common that very often, perhaps not every time we run across one, but very often they come in context of judgment. And you could even make the case that Exodus 24 fits that because God has gathered to himself at Mount Sinai a sinful people, the Israelites, who need to learn about right and wrong, and God is laying down the law from Mount Sinai, judging the sins of his people, as it were, explaining to them what is wrong with the way that they're living. Uh, Of course, 1 Kings 22, the death of King Ahab is decreed. Isaiah gets his commission to preach this message of coming destruction to the kingdom of Judah. Uh, Psalm 97 talks about the adversaries being Uh, destroyed with fire and so forth from the presence of the Lord. And so here in Revelation 4 and 5, it should not surprise us that before we hear about how God is going to judge this wicked adversary, the Roman Empire, that we should get this picture of God in his greatness. And very often also, these kinds of scenes are set in contrast with false gods. The false gods are made out of wood and stone, but the true God is majestic and glorious and exalted and awesome in his appearance. And we have the very same thing I want to suggest to you going on here. Remember that we are going on the uh, interpretive key, as it were, that the book is about the emperor cult that was facing the early Christians, and that Christians were being asked and ordered to bow down to the image of the emperor, to burn incense to his image and honor him as a god. 
There were idols involved in this test that is coming. We saw some hints of that in the letters in chapters 2 and 3. And so here we have a picture of the true God in contrast to the false God, the Roman emperor who claims to be a God but is no God at all. And there is a, a very simple point to all of this. The point is to impress us with God's control. It is as if the story begins by saying, now before we talk about what God's going to do, and before we go to the end of the story to reassure you that everything's going to be okay, the first thing you ought to see is God. Because if you can get a glimpse of God, you'll understand that God is in control. He's not about to lose. You're not about to lose if you'll be faithful. If you'll be on the side of God, it's going to be fine. This God is all-powerful. There is nothing like him from one end of the universe to the other. Nothing can stand in front of him. His enemies don't stand a chance. And if you get a glimpse of this God on his throne, it will set your mind at ease. But even perhaps more than that, it corrects any idea that anyone would have had that maybe God had withdrawn from the world. Uh, this was a common idea among the Jews in the first century. And some of the literature that they wrote that is called the intertestamental literature wonders out loud about this. Why are we suffering at the hands of our enemies? Why have the Romans taken over our country? Why are we being oppressed with all of these foreigners and the conclusion that some people were starting to come to, maybe at least just on a popular level, is, well, maybe God has withdrawn from us. Maybe we've offended God so badly this time that, that he'll have nothing to do with us. There's perhaps even a more sinister concept brewing among some people. You remember in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah says in Isaiah 59, that the Lord's arm is not so short that he cannot save. His ear is not so dull that it cannot hear. And that's what people were saying about God. Who's going to get us out of this mess? Here we are in captivity, and guess God can't do anything about it. Well, John wants us to see this picture of God so that we have no doubt that God has not withdrawn from the scene. He knows what's going on. He is intimately involved in the way things work in this world and in this struggle. And let there be no doubt about it, he's going to win this fight. So it is supposed to be an image of comfort. And that's what it looked like right there. If you ever had any wonders about that. There are... Uh, I've got a couple of these things. I don't know if I should show them to you or not. Some of you have, some people said they have a, a problem, you know, visualizing things. Uh, some religious groups like uh, the premillennialists and the witnesses and so forth, some of these people have got some great graphics on these things. But um, if you don't need them, fine. If you like them, that's fine as well. But it is this picture of glory. Let's start, therefore, in chapter 4 and verse 1. After these things I beheld and be, uh, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I had heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me said come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things That invitation to come and see is the typical apocalyptic mode of this kind of literature that somebody is invited to see something that you would not, never know otherwise, that a messenger gets invited to see the secrets of heaven so that God may set his people at ease. And the point of this is to set suffering people and worried people at ease. I'm going to show you, the voice says, what's going to happen so that you'll know that everything is going to be all right. And so John says in verse 2, Immediately I was in the Spirit, which makes John what the Old Testament, the old, old term for it was a seer. Before prophets were called prophets, they were called seers because they could see visions in which God communicated his will. 
And so John is now in the spirit and he is able to behold things. And what he sees in verse 2 is a throne was standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Back in 1 Kings 22, that vision of God that Micaiah had, he said, remember, I saw God sitting on his throne and his elders were all around him. And God said, who will go and take care of Ahab for me? And there's a council, a meeting going on in which God is planning the destruction of this evil man. Well, we're going to get that same kind of image here, that God is in control. He is planning to do something about this enemy of God's people, and uh, John is now kind of brought into the picture to see these things. He has been transposed to the heavenly realm to see the heavenly uh, spiritual view of what is going on. Uh, The description of the throne we get in verses 4, 5, and 6 there. Uh, There's flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, verse 5, seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and round the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. There's a very simple point to all of this. And it would be easy, I think, to get bogged down in the details. Why are there seven lamps? And, and why is the sea described like crystal? And what, why, why do all these creatures have so many eyes? There might be a point to every little detail, but we want to make sure we get the big picture. And that is that this is the most majestic, brilliant scene that anybody could ever imagine. That God is here in all of his glory, and everything about this scene speaks awe, majesty, power, and might. Thunder, lightning, uh, brilliance, beauty, everything that is the best is associated with this scene. Interestingly enough, there are also these 24 thrones around the throne of God, which perhaps represents all of God's people. Remember in Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to his disciples that when the Son of Man comes in his regeneration, you will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And we're going to see here uh, that heaven later on is described in multiples of 12 for that apparent reason as well. In Exodus 24, we have the 70 elders that were with Moses in the presence of God as well. And uh, Isaiah 24, 23 alludes to this kind of thing as well. So it is not unusual for God to be surrounded by representatives of his people, and that's probably what these 24 thrones are, representatives of the people of God. And there's another clue to that. We are told that those who are sitting on these thrones are clothed in white garments with golden crowns. There are two crowns. Uh, in the book of Revelation. There's two words for crown in the Greek language. There's the crown that a king wears, and then there's the crown that somebody who won something wears. And the crown that they are wearing in this scene is the crown that a victor would wear. And so they are wearing the victory crowns, wearing white garments. We already saw in chapter 3 and verse 5 that that is an allusion to the purity of the saints, And so it suggests that these 24 leaders or elders of God's people are representative of the redeemed, uh, all of them. There is, as we said, lightnings, peals of thunder, reminding us of God in his presence at Mount Sinai where the mountain was shaking and there was thunder and fire there. And verse 6, there is something like a pavement. We saw in Exodus 24 uh, that when the elders were seeing God up there on Mount Sinai, that beneath his feet was a pavement of, of something like sapphire. And that is apparently what is like here, this crystal clear, perfectly smooth, 
floor on which the throne of God sits. Uh, that turns out actually to be a pretty important little piece of the detail, but we're going to come back to that later in the book, so keep that tucked away in your memory. There are also four living creatures uh, here around the throne, we are told. The first creature is like a lion, the second like a calf, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. And this is where it starts to get weird, right? Because thrones, we can picture that, but these things, we have nothing in our experience like them. Well, they are composite characters that have features of all kinds of descriptions of cherubs and seraphs in the Old Testament. Of Isaiah 6, remember we saw the seraphs or the seraphim flying, each of them having six wings. We see creatures like this in Ezekiel 1 and 10, Psalm 80. Uh, somebody go to Psalm 80 in verse 1, and somebody else 99 in verse 1. We can look at those just uh, quickly. They are very often associated with the very presence of God. Who's got 80 in verse 1? Go ahead. You hear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that sittest above the cherubim, shine forth. God sits above the cherubim. It's an interesting concept, and we'll see what, what that means in just a moment. 99 1. Who has that? Tom? The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned above the cherubim, let the earth shake. He is enthroned above the cherubim. Here is kind of a small little depiction, I couldn't find a bigger one, of uh, Solomon sitting on his throne. And the depiction is an attempt to show what the Bible describes as his throne. The Bible says that on the right side and on the left of Solomon's throne was a cherub, that Solomon sat between the cherubim. And it doesn't take very long to figure out why God uh, would have this, and you can see the footstool underneath his feet here as well, because Solomon's throne was God's throne. God gave that authority and throne to Solomon, and when he sat on that throne, he was reigning with the power that God gave him. And so his earthly reign was a, a reflection of God's greater reign over Israel as well. Uh, but you not, not only see that in uh, Israel, you see it in the ancient Near East as well. This is from the sarcophagus of Hiram, the king of Byblos, and here you see the king sitting on his throne. Here's the back of it, and you'll notice that the side of the throne has a cherub. It has the body of a lion, the face of a man, and the wings of an eagle. Those are the side panels of the throne. Uh, here's a larger picture of the throne, and you can see the king sitting on his throne there. Uh, but these kinds of creatures are actually pretty common in the ancient world. We think they're rather strange, but John was actually using some imagery that the ancients would have been pretty familiar with. Uh, this is from Syria. That uh, should be 8th or 9th century B.C. I couldn't decide if it was the 9th century or the 9th century, I guess. <laughs> but uh, you can see this one's got the face of a man. It has the body of a lion, and it also has the wings of an eagle. And that one certainly has got an Egyptian look to it, because at that particular point, there was a lot of Egyptian influence all the way through the northern part of Syria there. This one is from even further east, from Nimrud. And you can see there the body of a lion, wings of an eagle, and a human face. This one is from Carchemish, 9th century B.C. This one's got two heads, head of a lion and the head of a man. This one is from Ashurbanipal's palace in Assyria. As you walked into the palace, there were these things. Those things are about 11 feet tall. And so you walked into this great palace, and there are these gigantic statues of these things. You'll notice that it too has... The body, this one's got the body of, a, of an ox, actually, and then the wings of an eagle and the face of a man. There's another one. These were all over the palace. And the idea was that when you walked into the palace of the king, you were in kind of a divine realm, that these heavenly kinds of beings were there. This is from Susa. You can see there is a bull with wings. This one is also from Susa. This has got a little bit of everything. It's got the face of a lion, 
the horns of a bull, the wings of an eagle, the front feet are the feet of a lion, the back feet are the feet of an eagle. So it's got everything in it. Now why would you do that? Because all of these are symbols of power. An eagle is a powerful, majestic bird. A lion is a strong, powerful animal. And so they took these images of strength and used them to express the strength of the king. Uh, this is from Megiddo, about 1300 BC. You can see the king of Megiddo sitting on a throne that is made out of cherubs there as well. So over and over again, we get this kind of imagery and it should not surprise us, therefore, that we have these kinds of beings in the presence of God described here, uh, these beings that represent uh, omniscience, power, strength, might, and all of those things. There is a difference, though, and lest we walk away thinking that John is just using imagery from his day, there is a point to all of this. That whereas the king of Megiddo or the king of Biblos sat on a throne that looked like a cherub, God is sitting among the cherubs himself. That God is not enthroned among statues or likenesses of these powerful beings. God is enthroned among living creatures who call out his praises. This is the real thing here. And... You'll notice in verse 8, they say the very same thing that was said in Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. And verse 9, they give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne. We're going to see this again in the book of Revelation of people in power coming and giving their crowns to the <laughs> Lord as a way of saying that I have nothing compared to you, God, that you've got all the power and, and my power belongs to you, that you deserve it all, like we're going to see in 21, 24, uh, and so forth. And they praise God in verse 11, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. They praise God as the Creator. Now, why would they praise God as the creator? Well, the point is very simple, because the creator has control over his creation. Like the potter and the clay, God is in control. And so when you see the curtain of heaven pulled back in this great image of God sitting on his throne, and you get to hear what goes on up there, God is being praised as the one who has all the power, and there is no need for these people to worry. Uh, interestingly enough, though, there is, it seems to me, something going on here uh, above all of this. Remember that we are working on the view that the enemy here is the Roman emperor cult, that that is the crisis facing these people. And it is interesting in that regard that we hear these hymns of praise in chapters 4 and 5. If you were to read some of these other Jewish apocalyptic texts, you would find that there are rarely hymns in them. But there are a ton of them in Revelation. Why? Well, they serve several purposes. One is that they comment on events in the text. We're told in this hymn why God is being praised so much, because He is the Creator. Um, but not only that, I believe that John is taking a swipe at the Roman emperor cult here and that he is using something that the people of his day would have normally understood to be associated with the Roman emperor and saying, no, that belongs to the true God. Let me show you some examples. This is from Plutarch's biography of the Roman emperor Titus. And he talks about uh, the honor that the Chalcidians were paying to the emperor Titus and it says in the red print there, even down to our own day, a priest of Titus is duly elected and appointed, and after sacrifice and libations in his honor, a set hymn of praise to him is sung. And Plutarch says, I don't want to quote the whole thing, but here's what it says. And notice the red letters, to great Zeus, to Rome, to Titus, and to the Roman faith, 
Hail Pan Apollo, Hail Titus our Savior. That's the song that they would sing in honor of the Roman emperor. Now you look at that and you say, now chapter 4 makes sense. That there's a false god being worshipped with a hymn. Here's the true god being worshipped with his hymn. This is from uh, Laconia called the Gaithion uh, Stila. It records how to celebrate the birthday of Augustus. Uh, they would take the images of Augustus, Julia, and Tiberius, put them on chairs, and the inscription says that the representatives and all magistrates offer sacrifices, but not until the musical performances enter on behalf of our ruler's salvation. And then they bring in all the young men participating in the parade wearing wreaths of bay and clad in white. This was a thing that was done to honor the Roman emperor. This is a decree from the city of Ephesus. Remember, Ephesus is where there was a temple to the emperor. Uh, this decree of the commune of Asia that ran the emperor cult says this, that we're supposed to uh, gather on the birthday of of the uh, emperor, notice it is the most holy birthday of Sebastus Tiberius Caesar God. That's how he's described. And performs a task that contributes greatly to the glory of Sebastus in hymning the imperial house and performing sacrifices to the Sebastian gods. Sebastus is another, it's the Greek word for Augustus or Caesar. This is what is told to us about Caligula, the emperor who was emperor after Tiberius in the first century that he used to go around acting like a demigod or a god. He would dress himself up like the gods. And immediately he had it arranged that there were established choruses who had been carefully trained singing hymns to him and sang Bacchic hymns in his honor when he was dressed up like the god Bacchus. So what was going on in the first century? Well, people were singing hymns to the Roman emperor and they were referring to the Roman emperor as their savior, the person who had brought their life into safety. Uh, this is Dio Cassius, the, uh, the Roman historian, talking about Nero. And Nero, of course, always loved to be praised. And uh, here's what they would say in the red uh, print there. Glorious Caesar, our Apollo, our Augustus, another Pythian, by thyself we swear, O Caesar, none surpasses thee. This is what they would say when the emperor would be honored. Now you hear those kinds of things, you get a sense of what people were doing for the emperor, and then you read Revelation 4, and it's not just a picture of God anymore, it's a picture of God versus the false god, the Roman emperor. With that in mind then, let's look at chapter 5 if we can this evening. I think we can. In the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. It's common in ancient times to find documents that are still sealed. They have a rope tied around them, folded up, and then a piece of clay stamped on them. We read about a sealed book in Daniel 7 and 10, suggesting that you don't know what's inside. It is secret. It's undisclosed. And in the case of God's word, what is in there hasn't happened yet. What is this book? Well, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Some have thought that it's the book of life. Some think it's the Old Testament, that Jesus opens it. He's the key to it. Some think that it is the future that is about to happen. Some think it is God's plan to judge. Some think it is simply God's will. that is described in terms of a book in the Old Testament. I want to suggest to you that it might not be any of those things, uh, that it is a covenant book, probably. In Roman times, when you wrote your will, you would write it down on a scroll, and you would write on the outside of the scroll a summary of the contents, so that when somebody looked it up, this is the will of so-and-so for his family, their name is so-and-so. It would be witnessed and sealed by seven witnesses. That was the, the Roman legal requirement. Seven people had to witness the signing of your will. It was only unsealed and executed when you died, and a trustworthy executor was required to put the will into effect. That is exactly the picture we have here in Revelation 5, that there is a book written inside and on the back, 
and it is sealed up with seven seals, John says. And the strong angel is proclaiming, who's worthy to open the book? Who can be the executor of God's will, as it were? No one was found worthy to open it. John says, I began to weep because no one was found worthy. And the, one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. The lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Of course, to open the scroll means not only to find out what's in it, to read it, but in the case of God's word, it means to do what is said in there. And so somebody with power is required to come and do what the will says. And we are told that there is a person who can do this, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. That language goes back to Genesis 49, where uh, Jacob was blessing his children. He said that Judah is a lion's whelp. And in Isaiah 11, uh, 1, we have there the branch, the one who is called the branch, who is the messianic figure. And this is one of the more dramatic moments in the book of Revelation, if you ask me. We're about to find out what's in the scroll. Someone has been identified. The Lion of Judah is going to come. And so in your mind, you're thinking, okay, the next thing I'm going to see is a lion. But you don't. Verse 6, I saw between the throne and the elders a lamb standing, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in all the earth. And he took the book out of the hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took it, then the praise erupts in verse 9. The Lamb is worthy to open the book. He is powerful. He has been given all authority because he is the one that was slain. He humbled himself. Paul says in Philippians 2, verses 8 and 9, He humbled himself to death, yea, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9 talks about, after having made purification for sins, he took his seat at the right hand of the majesty on high. Because he was so dedicated to God, he held nothing back and gave his life. He is worthy of to be given this great task, this reign, this rule. He was victorious in his death and resurrection. And you'll notice that where he is standing, he is standing right in the middle of everything, that he is standing between the throne and, uh, verse 6, between the throne and the elders, right there in the, the spot where you would expect to see God is the Lamb of God. And the point is obvious, that he has the deity of God himself. He has the power. He has the glory. He has the majesty of God himself, that in all ways he is equal to God. He's described as having seven horns and seven eyes. Horns, in apocalyptic literature, is a symbol of strength. We're going to see other things in the book that have horns, and it's a way of describing how strong that they are. So he has seven horns, and uh, some of this lion imagery, again, is common in the ancient world. This is an ancient Israelite seal from Megiddo, got the lion on it, inscribed Shema, servant of Jeroboam. Nobody knows where that is right now. It disappeared in Istanbul, Turkey, 30 years ago. So if any of you ever get a chance to go on one of those Bible Land tours and you get to go to the flea market in Istanbul, I wouldn't be surprised if it turns up there. This is from the Ishtar Gate in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's palace was decorated with lions as symbols of strength. This is the lion of Amphipolis standing out there in front of the city, uh, uh, one of the Hellenistic burial monuments indicating the strength of the people that died defending that city. This is the ancient harbor of Miletus. All the brown stuff back here is where the water used to be, and ships would sail past this, and there was a lion on each side of the harbor as you sailed into that city, reminding you of the strength of that city. Lions were common in ancient uh, iconography. Here's Alexander wearing the headdress of a lion to indicate his strength. 
And so again, this is not anything that people would have been unfamiliar with. The praise is given to the Lamb for what He did in verses 9 and 10, that you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and you made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. This is the new song that they sing, and uh, it is described in the very kinds of terms that we hear in the Old Testament as well, especially concerning the song of Moses. Um, Moses and the Lamb we sometimes talk about. But here they are uh, singing a new song, a praise song, a victory song for what has happened. There are several Old Testament precedents for that as well. Deuteronomy 32, Judges 5, the song of Deborah, uh, and other passages. And I want you to notice here that the Lamb is praised just like God. In chapter 4 and verse 11, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. And here it is, worthy are you. The very same thing said of God is said of the Lamb, again, indicating that he is just like him. Uh, he, he took uh, people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, which is used of Babylon in the Old Testament, which in the New Testament becomes who? Who? Rome. So you see again this conflict, this contrast between Rome and the true God. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests, indicating the language from Exodus 19 where God said that very thing of, of Israel. And now, as John looks at the closing scene here, the whole universe joins in the praise. I looked the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the number of them was myriads of myriads. I believe, if I'm not mis... 10,000 times 10,000 is a million, right? That's how you say a million in Greek. There's a million of them here. And thousands of thousands. And they all cry out, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive, receive power, riches, and wisdom, might, honor, and glory, and blessing. And every created thing in heaven and on the earth, under the sea, on the sea, all things in them is praising the Lamb to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. So the whole universe joins in the praise, and this is how the book is basically going to end, back in heaven with this scene of God having won, just like we all knew he would, and God's people with him in safety. I well, appreciate your good attention as always. We'll continue on uh, next Wednesday.